I agree. I, I think that what you presented actually, hopefully I'll surprise you a little bit, but I'm really not going to talk about new drugs. And I think that um, everything, I'm going to focus on what to do with this patient right now and how I would how we should at least think about this patient. And I think everything that Kuhn said is reasonable and appropriate, and autotransplant is a good therapy, and it's well tolerated. But you didn't show that it was better than other things. And that's what I'm going to push back on a little bit. So I think it's fine to do an autotransplant, but I think it's not quite correct in my mind to say it's better than some of the alternatives. And that's what I'm going to uh, focus on here. And I'm not really going to pull in new drugs too much. Uh, actually, probably not at all. So as Kuhn pointed out, the randomized data of a more or less intensive approach, and if you put uh, transplant in the intensive and maybe hyper-CVAD in the intensive versus everything else in the non-intensive, there's really, as I see, only one randomized trial, which I'm going to present a little bit differently, but the same trial. Uh, I would agree that less, in, I think we all would agree, less intensive treatment is less toxic. Getting our CHOP while you're getting it or getting whatever chemotherapy versus a transplant, it's less toxic to get a less intensive therapy, but there may be more chronic toxicity either way. Um, if you need ongoing treatment, if you have toxicity from the acute or ongoing treatment, or if you relapse, that could give you some toxicity as well or symptoms, et cetera. So I think intensive treatments have more toxicity in the short term and also may have some longer term toxicities that um, you know, can be reflected in quality of life, fatigue, cytopenias, secondary malignancies, et cetera. And I, I won't overstate that, but uh, I think that has to figure into the equation. The key issue in interpreting all these data, in my mind, are that all of the data with transplant are with better patients. They're all younger patients or largely younger patients, good performance status, mostly normal LDH if you look at these studies carefully. Yes, some of them can do well without treatment, but I'm not going to really talk about watching and wait. And um, so the outcome for these patients, if you see a good result, you don't know. Is it because the, the treatment was so great or because the patient was great? And I think any study with a median five-year overall survival in mantle cell lymphoma should not be that impressive. Uh, I think that we can do and generally do do better, although there are exceptions at each end of the spectrum. And of course, there are therapies for the relapse setting that are going to be applicable for patients who get intensive therapy or use less intensive therapies all the way along. So I, I would argue that progression-free survival is undoubtedly better if you do a more intensive treatment, and that the trade-off of the longer PFS is these toxicity issues, uh, and it's toxicity of the treatment and the timing of the toxicity, the nature of the toxicity, um, when it happens, how long it lasts, et cetera, the toxicity of the disease if the patient relapses sooner. Um, but at the end of the day, as we alluded to earlier, without clear overall survival benefits, I think we're going to continue to have these debates, and I don't think we have clear overall survival benefits. I would argue that blastoid disease probably should be treated more intensively, and I'm certainly quite supportive of intensive treatments as part of clinical trials, but I think to tell a patient who's young who can get a transplant that they need to get a transplant or that they're going to do better with a transplant um, is a matter of opinion, not a matter of fact, in my view. So a lot of these are based, and Kuhn showed you several of them, because there's only really one randomized trial to look at this question, are based on phase two studies. And uh, some of them are multi-center, some are single center, some are bigger, some are smaller. Um, but these are heavily influenced by who's treating the patients, what patients' preferences are. Uh, and uh, the randomized data are quite limited and obviously things are changing. So this is a series that Peter Martin put together, and this goes back some time ago. And I just want to make a point. I don't want to get too far into the numbers, but these are some, and I would admit, older transplant data, roughly 10 years ago. But these are uh, some of the data that we have here are, are older data, showing that overall survival with transplant 10 years ago was somewhere around five years, some of these a little bit longer, some a little bit shorter. You see the nature of the studies. And, and I think everyone would argue we're probably better off than that now for various reasons. 
if you think about an intensive treatment, and I'm picking on hyper CVAD plus auto transplant because I'm going to guess that some people pick that for this patient, you have to remember the patient selection and you have to remember how patients, you know, what's being reported, those curves, what patients do they reflect. So if you take everybody who walks in the door with mantle cell and then you say, well, I'm going to treat them all with hyper CVAD or some variation of an intensive regimen to get them to a transplant, and then they get through that regimen and then they get the transplant. Some might argue that if you start at the beginning, oh, everybody's going to get through all of that. But some might argue that what you're actually seeing the data on are the people in the upper right corner, those that got through all that treatment and did well. And I'm going to give you, I'm going to highlight that in just a minute for you in the one randomized trial that we have in this data. So Peter looked at our data at Cornell where we tended not to do as many transplants before Kuhn came. Uh, and some data from MD Anderson and some data from the Nebraska group where they tended to give patients chemotherapy, often hyper CVAD, and then auto transplant. You can look at the patient population. Uh, I would say they're pretty similar. And when you look at the overall survival data, I would say they're pretty similar. So again, this goes back a while, you know, five year overall survival, uh, a bit uh, re relatively similar. Certainly not compelling for one of these approach versus another. And when Peter published this, he did this mess of a chart, which I really love because it taught me a whole lot, when, and I hope it taught Peter a lot, this is several years ago, about how you can bias studies when you do retrospective analyses. And Peter actually went through and looked at these different studies and how our study could be biased by, you know, we took everybody who walked in the door, but we had some retrospective biases, and when you looked at these other centers, they had retrospective biases, and it's all over the map. So you have to just, I'm not saying one is better than the other, but these studies are just full of biases that if you don't at least know that they exist, you may not be able to correct for them. If you don't know they exist, you can get fooled. So um, Kuhn presented this data. These are the one randomized, uh, this is the one randomized trial looking at this issue. Uh, and it's basically before rituximab largely, patients got uh, CHOP and then either got interferon or auto transplant. So I'm going to point out to you that there were, at the top here, 228 patients that went in and were valuable on this study at the very beginning. And you can see that uh, they either got CHOP or R CHOP. Most of them got CHOP. When you look at this curve, you lose a lot of patients. When you look at the number of patients, this is the responders, differences. And when you look at the overall survival, which is not significant, but you look at the numbers, you know, something like 40% of the patients are gone. Where do they go? We started with 220, 230, 260, I think you had on your curve, and right now we have about 140 or so. So a lot of patients have fallen off the, these curves, and it's hard to know exactly what happened to them, but I think that, and, and I'm not criticizing that they're not here, I'm just saying things happen, and so when you look at these curves, they don't reflect that patient necessarily that you met that day because some patients fall off of these curves and out of these analyses. And at the end of the day, this analysis is really um, largely one that is heavily, heavily influenced by the MIPI score. When you look at the MIPI, and as you all know, there are different versions of the MIPI, but if you look at it, the things that fit the MIPI are younger age is good MIPI, Better performance status, good MIPI, uh, and uh, low LDH is good MIPI. And when you look at all of the transplant studies, it's younger patients, better performance status, and they tend to have um, better LDHs. So the MIPIs tend to be quite low. And as you can see, patients with low MIPI do better. And you know, is this because they all got transplanted and the transplant made them do better, or is this because they all um, are, uh, are better patients because they have better prognostic features. So you have to put that together. And you know, in a randomized trial, that works itself out. But in phase two trials, it doesn't work itself out so well uh, because you're leaving out a lot of the poor risk patients. And so I just am um, going to show you a couple of things when you look at the various studies. And this is, again, from the European group. Uh, this was published in JCO last year, looking at various studies lumping together elderly or older patients, I shouldn't say elderly, and younger patients, some transplanted, some non-transplanted, um, the, the quote-unquote control arms of their randomized studies in Europe or the uh, experimental arms. And the net is, this is all broken out by MIPI, you don't need to see the details, the good risk MIPI patients do better. 
And the conclusion, or one of the conclusions of this paper, although albeit it's limited um, for a variety of reasons, was that the treatment didn't really matter. Now, there were different patient groups, not huge numbers of all the treatments, so I don't want to take that too far, but the point being that the MIPI seems to be the big fa factor in how patients do. And so here's one slide on new data, which I'm not going to talk about, but, you know, BR, median PFS, three years. Not so bad. It's not the old data with our CHOP where it was a year or, or uh, a few months beyond that. And I just want to show you Again, two patients. These are older patients with mantle cell lymphoma treated with our CHOP followed by our maintenance. Now, the problem with this study is patients have fallen off with this study as well for various reasons. Uh, some didn't make it to the secondary randomization of maintenance, et cetera. But the point being that if you look at overall survival, this is now in older patients, those who went on to get the full therapy, to get randomized. Uh, which is really uh, who got our chop and went on to get randomized to maintenance and get it, which is the bottom right corner. That overall survival, if you can see that, with the rituximab maintenance group after our chop, again, in those that made it to the secondary randomization, which is the same kind of an equivalent of those that made it to the transplant, if you're not doing an intent to treat, that overall survival is pretty good. You go out five years, it's about 90% or so, 80 to 90%. For, uh, for that group of patients. And then more recently, we've had in the New England Journal of Medicine data, uh, RCHOP versus bortezomib RCHOP, and this is the progression-free survival. Again, this is older patients, a balanced flippy risk group, uh, and you can see the progression-free survival here, not fabulous, but okay, two years at the uh, combination arm, remembering these are a more balanced group of patients, a lot more older patients. The overall survival group here, looking at five years is 50 to 60 percent. Again, in older patients, these are people that just got our CHOP or our CHOP with bortezomib and didn't get rituximab maintenance. Now, obviously, some of them have gone on to get new drugs and other things, but the point is that the overall survival here in this relatively less favorable, less selected group of patients is five years, which is what we would have thought of before as being the whole group. So things are getting better uh, in mantle cell. And so, you know, now we have trials that this is the intergroup trial that's going on right now, bendamustine rituximab with or without bortezomib, with or without lenalidomide or rituximab maintenance in combination or alone. And then we now have uh, the triangle trial, which is, I think, a very important trial being done in Europe where we're actually answering the question. And so hopefully before long, we will get an answer to this question where patients are, are getting treated with RCHOP plus our DHAP, basically uh, uh, what's felt to be uh, by many a, a preferred induction regimen prior to going to transplant. And then the patients either get, um, they either get a transplant, they get a transplant with ibrutinib maintenance for two years, or they get no transplant and ibrutinib maintenance. Now this is going to be primary endpoint time to treatment failure. Uh, I think that's a reasonable endpoint, but again, at the end of the day, overall survival quality of life will be uh, what we care the most about. So to conclude, I think transplant is an excellent option. I think certainly patients should hear about it, think about it, discuss it. I think that it's fine to get a transplant. I think it's appropriate for some patients. I think that, however, we do have to recognize that it's not clear to me that based on these biases that it's truly a superior uh, uh, outcome. And then at the end of the day, um, I think we need to get better at looking at overall survival, looking at quality of life. And I think uh, certainly much of this is influenced more by personal preferences of the patients and admittedly the physicians as well. So thank you very much.